look, putting Jody in the car and driving off the George Washington Bridge, that would be preferable to having to put her in one of these schools. And it's only because of Lauren, the fact that I have another child, that I probably didn't do it. I'm autism. I'm visible in your children, but if I can help it, I am invisible to you until it's too late. I know where you, you live. You can't really and take guess what? off of autism. I live there too. Autism never took I hover around all of you. A lot of ways I know no like color barrier, no religion, no morality, no morality. No morality. No morality. No morality. No I speak your language fluently, and with every voice I take away, I acquire yet another language. I'm the faster than pediatric AIDS, cancer, and diabetes. And if not for any merit, your life will fall into my hands, and I will be over. I'll sleep. My name is for parents. I will make everything about the end of the family and see what happens with the family and the family and the family. Going to the child into their own hands. I will plot to rob your children. I will make sure that every day you wake up, you will cry. We will take care of my child after I die. And the truth is, I still will. Making children's best the we have these things called dream realism. Well, that's why we're over here. We're all starting to associate with vaccinations. But it is true that we are probably giving way too many to teach what's happening. And a lot of pediatricians now recognize our vaccination are cutting down on the number and proximity of those around the country. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I am autism. I'm visible in your children. But if I can help it, I am invisible to you until it's too late. I know where you live. <laughs> and guess what? I live there too. <laughs> I hover around all of you. I know no color barrier, no religion, no morality, no currency. I speak your language fluently. And with every voice I take away, I acquire yet another I work very quickly. I work faster than pediatric AIDS, cancer, and diabetes combined. Ooh. And if you're happily married, I will make sure that your marriage fails. Your money will fall into my hands, and I will bankrupt you for my own self-gain. I don't sleep, so I make sure you don't either. I will make it virtually impossible for your family to easily attend a temple, birthday party, or public park without struggle, without embarrassment, without pain. Ooh, you have no cure for me. 
Your scientists don't have the resources, and I relish their desperation. Ooh. Your neighbors are happier to pretend that I don't exist. Of course, until it's their child. <laughs> I am autism. I have no interest in right or wrong. I derive great pleasure out of your loneliness. I will fight to take away your hope. I will plot to rob you of your children and your dreams. I will make sure that every day you will wake up and cry, wondering who will take care of my child after I die. <laughs> and the truth is, I am still winning, and you are scared. And you should be. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Autism Speaks, the world's largest autism charity organization. I'm glad that they love us so damn much. Wait a minute. What am I saying? These guys suck. <sighs> The road to hell is often paved with good intentions. And it should come as no surprise that this perfectly summarizes what Autism Speaks is. There is no known cure for autism, because autism is not a disease. But rather, it is something much more nuanced and complicated. It is deeply ingrained in one's personality, their identity. If one wants to erase autism, they must erase the autist themselves. There is no medical cure for autism. The only cure for autism is death. This was the conclusion that Nazi Germany came to when it enacted policies to eradicate entire groups that it deemed undesirable and even burdensome to society. As Jack S. Boozer, professor of religion in the college and graduate school of arts and sciences at Emory University once put it, one of the more unexplored yet frightening aspects of the Nazi years in Germany, 1933 to 45, is the conduct of the doctors during those years. This is most certainly true, for the doctors of Nazi Germany abandoned the traditional guiding ethics of medicine and carried out medical experiments without the consent of their quote unquote patients. These people weren't actually patients in the sense that they were being treated for a disease, but rather in the Nazis' eyes, they were the disease. The treatment the Nazi doctors had in mind for those deemed undesirable were involuntary, quote unquote, euthanasia and mass sterilization. Ever since his rise to power, Hitler believed that the Jews were a burden to society, for they had supposedly stabbed Germany in the back during World War I. He believed that they were incurable, and so it would be better if they could just disappear. This same mentality was applied to other groups deemed undesirable. Jehovah's Witnesses, Romani, homosexuals, and of course, disabled people. Since autism is labeled as a disability, I've been haunted by an existential question that I've been asking myself since I first learned about the Nazis way back in middle school. Would someone like me be murdered by the Nazis? The answer, I believe, is a resounding yes. When it comes to studying the history of autism, one thing that is often glossed over by everyone is the fact that when Austrian pediatrician Hans Asperger was conducting his pioneering studies on autism, he was conducting them during a time when the Nazis ruled over Austria. For a long time, Hans Asperger was seen as this compassionate man who advocated for no diversity when no one else would. He was often seen as an Oscar Schindler figure who used his diagnosis as a way to keep children from dying at the hands of the Nazis. This image has been cemented for decades, until recently, when scholars Herwig Czech and Edith Schaeffer challenge this image in their respective works. Czech argues that Asperger's descriptions of his patients were unduly harsh and that he publicly legitimized race hygiene policies and actively cooperated with the child euthanasia program. 
Schaeffer agrees with Czech's criticisms of Asperger and asserts that while Asperger did support children he believed to be teachable defending their disabilities, he was dismissive about those he believed to be more disabled, and some of Asperger's judgments were death sentences. Indeed, such deprecatory judgments of autism are evident when one reads Asperger's 1944 treatise Die Autistischen Psychopathen im Kindesalter, Autistic Psychopathy in Childhood where the bulk of it is written with details that are disparaging and derogatory towards autistic children. As more and more evidence unravels, it is becoming more and more clear that not only did Asperger not protect his autistic patients, but he even sentenced 13 of them to the Nazi killing center known as Am Spiegelgrund, and two of those 13 children died. Despite the clarity these academics bring to Asperger's image, many apologists will argue that Hans Asperger could not have known about the Nazi killing machine and thus is not guilty of participating in it. When evaluating the arguments of Asperger's apologists, it is clear their arguments fail to effectively refute the arguments made by Czech and Schaeffer. The verdict of this video is that Hans Asperger is in fact guilty of knowingly participating in Nazi eugenics. Alrighty, y'all. We got the evidence here on deck. So with that, I say, let the post-mortem trial of Hans Asperger commence. The accused may now take his stand. Hans Asperger was born in Hausbrunn, Austria on February 18th, 1906. He later relocated to Vienna to study, earning his medical degree from the University of Vienna in 1931. Even before Nazi control of Austria began in 1938, some of the involvements and actions of Asperger point towards a troubling connection with Nazism. Most exemplary of this are his membership of Bund Neuland as an adolescent, his work under Franz Hamburger, and his professional collaborations with Erwin Riesack. Bund Neuland was a Catholic youth organization that existed in Austria and Germany during the, war, the interwar period. Asperger joined the Bund in the 1920s, at which time he would have been in his teenage years. Asperger was 15 when the Bund came to Austria in 1921. Czech characterizes organization as one with roots in the predominantly Volkish nationalist von der Vogel and the German youth movement. The Bund was explicitly in sharp opposition to everything perceived as Marxist, leftist, liberal, or modern, which included parliamentary democracy. According to Czech, the Bund always supported the fascist and authoritarian currents of the early 20th century. As the overarching organization of the Bund held a certain degree of political diversity, it also included subgroups that were more ideologically homogenous. Of these, Asperger was a member of the Farende Scholaren, Wandering Scholars, which was part of the Bund's decidedly volkish and right-wing faction. Membership of the Bund's Wandering Scholars group demonstrates that Asperger held some degree of fascist beliefs even in his adolescence. In May 1931, Asperger took employment at the Hill Pedagogische Station Therapeutic Pedagogy Ward at the Vienna University Children's Clinic under the leadership of Franz Hamburger. Hamburger had been appointed chair in 1930 and immediately began a campaign of pushing anti-Jewish policies at the clinic. Almost everyone hired by Hamburger were undoubtedly Nazis, with Asperger being the only one who had attained the highest academic qualification habilitation to not be totally dismissed as such after World War II's end. Interestingly, the only person in the clinic that was not a Nazi party member was Asperger himself. However, Asperger was a sympathizer, as you will see soon. The most infamous of Franz Hamburger's recruits was Erwin Jekelius, who was responsible for the deaths of thousands of disabled people under the Third Reich. Jekelius worked at the clinic from August 1933 
until February 1936. Even though Asperger himself never actually joins the party, his sympathetic view towards Nazism is demonstrated by the unreserved support Franz Hamburger held for him. In 1932, Asperger wrote a paper alongside Erwin Riesack. Riesack had been a colleague of Asperger's for some time in 1931 at Vienna University's Three Medical Clinic. Like Hamburger, Riesack had explicit Nazi ties, both before and after the Nazi Anschluss of Austria. Before the Anschluss, Riesack was professionally tied to Hans Eppinger Jr., director of the One Medical Clinic, as his assistant. Eppinger was later involved in the Dachau seawater experiments, in which prisoners at the Dachau concentration camp were deprived of all food and given only chemically processed seawater to study the viability of making seawater drinkable. These deeply inhumane experiments caused great pain and suffering, resulting in extreme dehydration and organ failure. Following the Anschluss, Riesack became personally entangled in Nazism, soon taking his role as one of the figureheads of the Nazi party in the Vienna Medical Faculty. Hans Asperger's connection to Erwin Riesack only cements his ties to Nazis pre-Anschluss already clear in his relationship with Franz Hamburger. Asperger's membership of the Bund Newlands Wandering Scholars and his professional involvement with individuals such as Franz Hamburger and Erwin Riesack show that he was sympathetic to the deadly ideology harbored by the Nazi party. Not only when it could be argued that this is simply a matter of self-protection, but even before the Nazis took over Austria with the 1938 Anschluss. Asperger's complacency with Nazism certainly grew under the Nazi control of Austria, but it did not completely start from nothing in 1938. Nazi Germany officially took control of Austria with the Anschluss of March 12, 1938. Austria remained under the domain of the NSDAP until the end of World War II when Germany finally surrendered to the Allies on May 8, 1945. In both Germany and Austria, medical professionals were deeply entwined with Nazi policy, not only by referring patients for and carrying out involuntary sterilization and quote-unquote euthanasia, but also through their mandated cooperation with the Reich's public health offices. Collecting a larger way of personal data on citizens of the Reich fell under the purview of the public health offices, which was responsible for gathering individuals' medical records, family histories, school reports, welfare visits, criminal records, and social and economic status and funneling the information into a hereditary index. On March 23, 1938, the Nazi regime created the guidelines for the implementation of the hereditary inventory to systematize the collection and organization of the public health office's data into a hereditary inventory. These guidelines were explicitly extended to Austria in early 1939 with a meeting of 250 people to disseminate directives for the hereditary inventory. Austrian medical professionals were required to aid in the creation of this hereditary inventory, as university clinics were instructed to provide their patients' medical files to the public health office. As Asperger worked at the Vienna University's children's clinic, he would have been required to provide the Nazi's public health office with sensitive information on his young, psychologically disabled patients. In his own writings on autistic psychopathy and his study of abnormal children, Hans Asperger demonstrated ideological ties to Nazism. Historian Edith Schaeffer argues that, as the Nazi regime radicalized, so too did Asperger's writings. Schaeffer posited that Asperger became increasingly more critical of autistic children over time, describing autistic psychopathy in ever more judgmental, social, and eugenicist terms, and incorporating ever more elements of Nazi child psychiatry. She pointed specifically to four quotes from Asperger, taken from various writings between 1937 and 1944. In 1937, Asperger wrote, 
there are as many approaches to child development as there are different personalities. It is impossible to establish a rigid set of criteria for a diagnosis. In 1938, he wrote, This well-characterized group of children who we name autistic psychopaths because of the confinement of the self, autos, has led to a narrowing of relations to their environment. In 1941, he wrote, A group of abnormal children, who we refer to as autistic psychopaths, they live their own lives without an emotional relationship with the environment. Finally, in 1944, he wrote, The autist is only himself, autos, and is not an active member of the great organism which he is influenced by and which he influences constantly. In these excerpts, one can see how Asperger quickly went from cautioning against creating diagnoses of socially abnormal children to describing autism as a well-characterized group of children. In 1944, Asperger had not only fed into eugenicist ideology by supporting the creation of distinct medical categories for all those who fell outside the norm, but had gone so far as to adopt the Volk's fascist rhetoric, pronouncing autistic children to be outside of the greater organism. This statement supported the Nazi idea that all citizens of the Third Reich were meant to serve as one whole group, with the collective efforts of the nation taking precedence over any individuality. Under this idea, those who fell outside of societal expectations, such as Asperger's autistic psychopaths, were seen as a threat to the overall success of the Reich. It is this sort of ideology that directly influenced the adoption of eugenicist policies such as the involuntary sterilization and even murder of disabled individuals. In addition to vague references to eugenics through his increasingly rigid and negative view of autistic children, Hans Asperger also made statements that more directly supported tenets of Nazi race hygiene and medicine, contributing to their legitimization. Historian Herwig Czech pointed to several excerpts from Asperger's publications from the late 1930s and 1940s as evidence that Asperger explicitly supported Nazi race hygiene. The first of these is from Asperger's 1938 paper, The Mentally Abnormal Child, which opened with a statement endorsing a Nazi approach to the fields of medicine and health. We stand in the midst of a massive reorganization of our intellectual and spiritual life, which has seized all areas of this life, not least in medicine. The central idea of the New Reich, that the whole is more than its parts, and that the Volk is more important than the individual, had to bring about fundamental changes in our whole attitude, since this regards the nation's most precious asset, its health. Another example is from a 1939 publication in which Asperger refers to negative eugenics with his assertion that physicians are responsible for ensuring that the diseased who would transmit their diseases to remote generations to the detriment of the individual and of the folk are stopped from transmitting their diseased hereditary material. Perhaps most damning of such statements came from a 1943 address in which Asperger explicitly refers to the role of medical professionals in carrying out eugenics, stating, We must also lead the way in the practical tasks of eugenics, especially with regards to the problems relating to the law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring. The law for the prevention of offspring with hereditary diseases, Gisets zur Verhutung Erbkranken, Nachvosis, enacted on July 14th, 1943, sorry about that, mandated the involuntary sterilization of Reich citizens deemed to be physically or mentally disabled. Hans Asperger publicly endorsed this intensely inhumane form of negative eugenic policy. Even more incriminating than any public statements Asperger made are records showing that he was involved in the referral of 13 disabled children to Vienna's Am Spiegelgrund clinic, and two of those 13 children died. Am Spiegelgrund was founded in July 1940 to treat, quote unquote, 
children who did not conform to the Nazi regime's criteria of hereditary worthiness and racial purity. In the years up to 1945, around 789 children died at the clinic, many of them murdered by poisoning or other methods. The Nazis relied on physicians to refer disabled children who had few other opportunities for placement at Spiegelgrund. Asperger was among the many physicians to refer disabled children to this euthanasia facility. On June 27, 1941, he examined two-year-old Herta Schreiber and made the following report on the young girl. Severe Personality Disorder Post-encephalitic, most severe motoric retardation, erratic idiocy, seizures. At home, the child must be an unbearable burden to the mother who had to care for five healthy children. Permanent placement at Spiegelgrund seems absolutely necessary. Herta arrived at Spiegelgrund on July 1st, 1941, and died on September 2nd of the same year from pneumonia, most likely which was induced by barbiturate poisoning. On October 22nd, 1941, Asperger examined five-year-old Elizabeth Schreiber, who is not related to Herta Schreiber, and made the following report. Erethic imbecility, probably on a post-encephalitic basis, salivation, encephalitic effects, negativism, considerable language deficit, is now slowly learning to speak with relatively better comprehension. In the family, the child is without a doubt a hardly bearable burden, especially with the crowded living conditions and due to her aggressions, she endangers the small siblings. Therefore, it is understandable that the mother pushes for institutionalization. Spiegelgrund would be the best possibility. Elizabeth arrived at Spiegelgrund on March 1942 and died on September 30, 1942, like Herta from pneumonia. Hans Asperger namesake of Asperger syndrome and a defendant in this trial has been accused of knowingly participating in a Nazi killing machine that sought to eradicate disabled people. In his 1944 article titled Die Autistischen Psychopathen im Kindesalter, Autistic Psychopathy in Childhood, Asperger described a particularly interesting and highly recognizable type of child. Almost all of the children were described as being severely impaired in social integration, often struggled in school, and had behavioral problems similar to those that autistic people today exhibit. For example, almost all of them had extreme outbursts when angered. However, Asperger saw some potential in some of these children. For example, he saw how Ernst K., one of the children, exhibited independence in thought, experience, and speech. Asperger argues that autistic people are so often particularly original and delightful, and thus can be contributive members of society. However, it is important to note that this only applies to a specific type of autistic person, as not all autistic people are the same. Some of them have traits that society deems desirable, while others have traits that society deems undesirable. As Asperger himself once put it, with the less able children, who are much more disturbed however, the answers are not so much valuable as deviant. This statement was an extreme red flag because it begins the question, what became of these less able children? After all, Asperger makes it clear that, unfortunately, in the majority of cases, the positive aspects of autism do not outweigh the negative ones. So, what happens to these negative cases of autism? The answer that Herwig Check and Edith Schaeffer provide is the following. 
they are sent to Am Spiegelgrund to be put out of their misery. In other words, these kids die. The accusers may now take their stand. The narrative of Asperger as a principled opponent of National Socialism and a courageous defender of his patients does not hold up in the face of the historical evidence. What emerges is a much more problematic role played by this pioneer of autism research. In 2018, the more controversial aspects of Asperger's career were brought to light by Austrian scholar Herwig Czech. Czech argued that while Hans Asperger may have advocated for some of his patients, he only advocated for those he believed could be molded and educated into becoming productive members of society. However, there were many cases in which autistic children could not be molded and educated into becoming productive members of society. Asperger himself stated that in the majority cases, the positive aspects of autism do not outweigh the negative ones. While Asperger deemed some of the psych autistic psychopaths capable of great intellectual achievements, other cases were deemed as bizarre, eccentric, and useless, with fluid transitions towards schizophrenia, whose main characteristics also autism, the loss of contact with the surroundings. Doctors in Nazi Germany, as well as in its occupied territories, believed that those who were hopeless were unworthy of life. Asperger himself was not exempt from this. Schaeffer argues that Asperger's overall judgment of autistic psychopaths was derogatory. Asperger maintained that autistic children had the potential for achievement only as long as they were intellectually intact and he devoted the majority of his case descriptions to such abled, autistic individuals. Schaeffer argues that Asperger drew a sharp line between children with positive versus negative worth. Asperger deemed Fritz and Harrow, to whom he devoted the vast majority of his treatise, to be on the favorable end of the autistic spectrum. When evaluating people like Ernst, who were deemed middle cases, Asperger was unsure as to whether they were particularly abled or mentally retarded. His words, not mine. Asperger concluded that the middle cases were the latter, thus explaining why Asperger came to the conclusion that the positive cases did not outweigh the negatives. With this in mind, we start to see a eugenicist hierarchy of the autism spectrum, where those deemed positive cases were at the top, while those who were deemed middle cases and negative cases were at the bottom. The positives got to see another day. The negatives did not. This is not just evident in Asperger's words, but also in his actions. Hans Asperger sent 13 of his own patients to a euthanasia center known as Am Spiegelgrund, a killing center where a total of 789 people's lives have been claimed due to being deemed unworthy of life. Of the 13 children that Hans Asperger personally sent to Spiegelgrund, two of them died. The other 11 children supposedly lived since it appears that none of their names appeared in Spiegelgrund's Book of the Dead, a catalog that documented the names of the victims in Spiegelgrund. What actually happened to these 11 other children is unknown. They could very well have survived, or they could have died, but records of their deaths were lost. What is definitely known, however, is that these other two children did die, for their names were mentioned in the Book of the Dead. These two children were Herta Schreiber and Elizabeth Schreiber, Herta Schreiber, age 2, had suffered from meningitis and diphtheria, and upon being evaluated by Hans Asperger, he concluded that Herta's permanent placement at Spiegelgrund is absolutely necessary. Elizabeth Schreiber, aged 5, was unable to talk, 
and had motor unrest after receiving a head cold in her second year of life. Although Asperger never joined the Nazi party himself, he was a close colleague with people who oversaw eugenics programs. While it is true that Asperger was the founder of the Vienna Society for Curative Education, it is important to note that his co-founders were Max Gundel, Erwin Jekyllius, and Franz Hamburger. Max Gundel was the head of Vienna's public health office and the municipal director of Spiegelgrund. Erwin Jekyllius was the medical director of Spiegelgrund. Franz Hamburger was a director of the University of Vienna Children's Hospital and worked behind the scenes to build Vienna's infrastructure of murder. He was also Asperger's mentor figure, who Asperger deeply admired. With this in mind, it is difficult to defend Asperger. The defense may now take the stand. In response to the criticisms of Czech and Schaeffer, Dean Falk argues that while it is true that Hans Asperger transferred 13 of his patients to Spiegelgrund, and while two of them died there, it is likely that Asperger was unaware that he was sending them to their deaths. While it is true that Asperger didn't openly resist Nazi inhumanities, Falk argues that his failure to have done so does not necessarily make him a villain. It would have been counterproductive to speak out explicitly against the Nazi law of forced sterilization. If Asperger did resist, he would not only run the risk of losing his job, but he could have been killed. If that happened, someone else could have taken his place and that person could have sent even more people to Am Spiegelbrand. So instead of openly resisting the Nazi-dominated medical establishment, Falk argues that Asperger resisted in more subtle ways by trying to influence the establishment to promote humane treatment of disturbed and disabled children, like how Oskar Schindler did with the Jews under his supervision. Tetzer et al. suggests that while it might be true that two out of the 13 children that Asperger referred to Spiegelgrund were killed, it is highly possible that Asperger had no idea that people were being killed there. In the words of Tetzer et al., there was no evidence that Asperger knew about the euthanasia program when he referred to patients who died at Spiegelgrund. Asperger referred the two children during June and October 1941, before most of the deaths at Spiegelgrund occurred and before its program became public knowledge. Objection! 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 Although Falk and Tetzer et al. both make convincing arguments, it is important to note that their arguments are mainly speculation. It may be true that the public didn't know about the euthanasia program, but it is important to note that Asperger is not among the public. He is not an average doctor. He is a doctor with a high level of agency and is close colleagues with Max Gundel, Erwin Jekyllius, and Franz Hamburger, doctors who most certainly did know about the euthanasia program and were in fact active leaders in it. The possibility that Asperger was ignorant of the euthanasia program when taking this into consideration is slim, extremely slim. The language that Asperger uses is very much in line with eugenicist thinking. Asperger had close ties with the higher-ups of Am Spiegelgrund, so he must have had some degree of knowledge about what was happening behind the scenes. Edith Schaeffer argues that the Spiegelgrund staff said that some parents held explicit conversations about death wishes for their children. When discussing Hertha Schreiber, it is important to note that her mother allegedly told Dr. Margaret Hoopsch that it would be better if she died. If these were indeed conversations that took place between parents and doctors, this implies that these parents must have had some degree of knowledge about the euthanasia program, 
Otherwise, they wouldn't explicitly hold death wishes with these doctors. Which means that some people among the masses did know about Spiegel Grun's killing center, at least to an extent. If that's the case, and the masses did know about the euthanasia program, given that some of them allegedly expressed death wishes for their children, then the idea that Asperger knew nothing about euthanasia falls flat on its face. With this context, the notion that Asperger knew nothing about Spiegelgrund holds the same level of validity as the idea that most Germans knew nothing about Auschwitz or the idea that most Austrians knew nothing about Mauthausen. If ignorance is Asperger's best defense, it is an insufficient defense. It doesn't change the fact that he participated in this program, which even Falk and Tetzer et al. acknowledge. Actions have consequences, and his actions, even if done in ignorance, still took the lives of Herta and Elizabeth. He still played a role in the killing machine of the Nazi regime. The verdict of this paper is that Hans Asperger is, in fact, guilty of knowingly participating in Nazi eugenics. This controversy is mind-opening, and if we are to ensure that history does not repeat itself, we must delve deeper into both the arguments for and against Asperger's involvement. Much of the rhetoric that Autism Speaks uses is borrowed straight from the textbook of the Nazi regime. Autism Speaks can claim to speak for autism all it wants. It most certainly doesn't listen to autistic people. Instead, it perpetuates nonsensical ideas about cures and vaccines causing autism. Autism Speaks has not learned this aspect of the history of autism. It has not learned about Am Spiegelgrund. Its ignorance has resulted in autism continuing to be treated as a disease. Everyone must learn this history. They must read the works of Hurry Check and Edith Schaeffer. We all must learn this history or risk repeating it. History has a cruel way of repeating itself. The idea that autism is to be cured must be changed. Otherwise, we will run the risk of creating the next Dom Spiegelgrund. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. It means a whole lot to me as an autistic person to be able to present this history to you guys. And it means a whole lot to you guys for having watched it. Because now you guys know an aspect of autism history that is never talked about. All the research you saw here was based off of my own research, which in turn was based off of the research of Hurry Check and Edith Sheffer. And the footage you saw was real. All that footage you saw was real. You even saw footage of me walking around at Am Spiegelgren. And you even saw footage of me walking around at the Central Cemetery, which was actually a memorial for the Spiegelgren victims. If you're curious about Spiegelgrund specifically as a Nazi killing institution, then please check out my video series called Child Dysthanasia. That is, the bad deaths of disabled children. It will talk about Spiegelgrund, and it will also go a little bit in depth into Hartheim Castle, and it will also talk about Mauthausen a little bit. That video series will be coming out pretty soon and I highly recommend that you watch it if you really enjoyed this video. If you want to learn about Asperger after World War II ended, as well as a broader contextualization of autism history, including the people that studied autism before Asperger, check out the lengthy video known as The Nazi, quote-unquote, Who Discovered Autism. It's a long, beefy video, but trust me, it'll be worth your time. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.